almost said good morning, <laughs> but good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to, well, I can't just say St. Thomas because that's not truly indicative of, of who we are today. This is an expression of Christ Church here in the West um, area of Cleveland, um, a partnership of many churches, an expression of the body of Christ as, as one singing, worshiping body. This is beautiful, everyone. Just, just, just take a moment, look around. Now, all respect to Pastor Smith, who will be bringing the word. That's the best sermon illustration I think you could see, is just seeing each other, the hands and body of Christ together, to celebrate the Reformation. So, welcome to this joint worship experience of so many churches coming together. Thank you to the choirs who have assembled and are bringing us wonderful numbers today. And thank you for the Wind Symphony for, for um, just enhancing our worship with your playing. I'm glad you all fit there. <laughs> There was just a little bit of anxiety about that, but, but you look very comfortable. Just, just nod and say, yes, we're comfortable. Let's <laughs> uh, see, announcements. Uh, well, one, there's a reception afterwards that you're all welcome to come and have um, this really appetizer level. Con
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. In thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Oh, 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 amen. This is the feast.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson for this, the Festival Sunday of Reformation, comes to us from the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter. The first reading for the Festival of the Reformation, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. and strength a very perfect trouble therefore we will not fear though the earth give way the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea though the waters roar and foam though the mountains streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is our refuge and our strength, our only help in trouble. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. And early morning dawns, the nations raid, the kingdoms taught her. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Glory be to the Father and to the Amen. God is 
our refuge and our strength, our only help in trouble. Our epistle lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom put forward as a propitiation by His blood. To be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. rise. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Glory 
So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Thus far the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. If there are any children here from the congregation, you can come on down to the front for a children's message. Otherwise, if none come forward, all of you will be the children. So we all have a vested interest in some children coming forward. <clears throat> How are you guys doing today? All right. Well, we've got okay. So this will be a nice little party up here. So I've got a I've got a bag here with a few. Oh, there's still more people coming. Come on down. Still plenty of wonderful seats available. If anyone else would like to come up. Um, so I I brought a little a little friend with me here today. Do you guys have any guesses who this fellow might be? Luther. Martin Luther. That is correct. You got you guys see him there. I call this guy Mini Martin. Any guesses why? He's, the real Martin is at least three times bigger than this guy. Um, <laughs> at least, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so this is little Martin, and he, um, now, as I said, the real one was bigger than this, but um, we're going to talk about some really big things that God did through Martin Luther. Um, about 500 years ago or so, 507 years ago it, to be exact from what, the day that we're talking about here today, Reformation Day. But see, he's got, what does he have in his hands there? It, it's a book. Any, do you want to guess maybe what the book might be? The Bible. You are correct. It is. It is a Bible. And also, what is that? What, is the, what does he have there? A quill, yeah, it looks like a feather, but that's that's like what they would write with, right? It was like a it was like a pen. Yeah, you got that's what you were gonna say, right? Like a pencil, yeah, kind of something to write with, right? Exactly right. So we've got Minnie Martin. We're gonna set him right here. Did anybody else get a good look? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so Martin Luther on October thirty first, fifteen seventeen, he took. Let's just pretend that these are nails. Ow. It's the closest thing that I could find to a nail. Um, took some nails and whoa. Oh, a hammer. Didn't do my workout. Uh, he, he took a hammer, right? Yeah. And he, what did he, what did he write and nail to the door of the church that day? Does anyone know what they were, what it was called? There were how many? There were uh, 47 or how many? 95 theses that is correct 95 theses and he took uh he wrote down all these things that he there were uh things that the bible said true things from the bible that the church had forgotten we had gotten we had gotten away from god's word and we had gotten some things wrong we had um people back then they they were all confused they thought that they got to go to heaven because of things that they did right if they followed the rules if they did enough things if they paid money for certain things then they would go to heaven and martin luther said that's not what the bible says he says it's all about what wait who who's the one that does things for us so we can go to heaven. Jesus, it's all about the work of Jesus. So he, bang, 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 bang. He, he nailed, nailed those things to the door, okay? Those nails, they, they changed the world. Because people then, they, they got, they started, eventually he translated the Bible into the language that people could read. Because most people, you know, we've got Bibles all over our houses and on our phones and on our tablets and everything. Back then people, they didn't have their own Bibles. So he said, even have books. 
books. They, yeah, they, book, books were kind of new back then. Yeah, yeah, and they were expensive. They weren't. Not everybody could have a book, and so in Luther's day, then he was like, well, "We got to get the word of God into people's hands." Um, now he was he was telling the story about someone else about Jesus, right? And there was also there's also something about nails in the story of Jesus, isn't there? Did Jesus nail something on a door? What what, what happened with nails? You know, he died on a cross, and they nailed him. So maybe another hammer, fifteen hundred years earlier, nailed Jesus to the cross. These nails also changed the world. Oh, there's a there's a cross made out of nails. So Luther was talking about how these other nails, the nails that nailed Jesus to the cross so that he died to take all of our sins away, he was saying, now, all you got to do is believe in Jesus. You don't, you don't have to pay money to have a place in heaven or have your sins forgiven. You don't have to do this and do that. It's a free gift of God. And Luther wanted everybody to know that. And so that's what we celebrate today as we're here in church 507 years later. We are so thankful that God worked through Luther so that we could have that same good news about those other nails that changed everything for us. So let's say thank you to Martin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Martin Luther. Um, but an even bigger thank you goes to who? Jesus, that's the correct answer. That is right. We are so thankful for Luther telling us, making sure that we could know the truth, the good news about Jesus. So let's fold our hands now. Um, all the kids here of all ages, I want you to fold your hands and repeat after me as we do our echo prayer. Dear God, Dear God, thank you so much, thank you so much for, sending for sending Martin Luther to give us, to give us the, truth the truth of the gospel. Of the gospel. And, thank you even more and thank you even more for sending Jesus, for sending Jesus to die on the cross, to, the cross, to, rise again, to rise again, to save us. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I, what we're going to do now, I think, I think we're, well, everyone can stand up because we're going to confess our creed. And kids, I think we're going to stay up here um, in the front also. And we're just going to turn, I think this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, and we're going to confess what we believe as Christians. Um, in the words of the Nicene Creed, if anybody wants to come around and, you know, look on my notes here. We confess together now, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scripture and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You can head back to your seat now. We can all be seated as we continue with our sermon hymn, 566, By Grace I'm Saved.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to imagine that you find yourself in just the most wonderful place that you can imagine. It's a luxurious community with every amenity that you could possibly ever desire. There is any type of food that you want given to you at any moment, any kind of drink you can just order and there it is. There's a spa and, and a pool and places to exercise and trails to walk on. It is, why, why would you ever want to leave? Just perfect. I, I'm transporting you on a vacation beyond your wildest dreams here right now. You can't imagine a better scenario. You feel safe. You feel secure. It is wonderful. One day you try to leave the premises and you... You pull up to the gate, oh, it's a gated community, wonderful. Uh, you pull up and the gate doesn't open for some reason, so you, you inch a little bit closer. Still nothing. You look around, is there some place to punch a code in? How do I get out of this place? You see a, a security guard comes over. He tells you that you are not free to leave. You've never been free to leave. You're stuck. Suddenly, you start to think about everything. Doesn't seem so great anymore. Did I imagine how wonderful this place was? This is not some type of resort. This is not some type of home. This is a prison. I'm stuck here. I'm not free. I was only fake free. I can't get out. That'd be a terrible feeling, wouldn't it? if your entire sense of reality was just upended in a moment. You thought one thing was going, really? No. You thought you were free and secure and things were wonderful. And no, you were stuck. It was a prison and you couldn't get out. You were not free to go. You were only fake free, not free indeed. A terrible feeling. Ask the Jews from John chapter 8, the Jews that Jesus is talking to, ask them if they've ever felt that way before, because that is really what happened to them. In this brief conversation, Jesus turns their entire world upside down. What they thought was up is down. They, what they thought was real wasn't real. What they thought, they thought they had freedom. No, they, they didn't have freedom. Very jarring if you find something like that out really throws your sense of reality into chaos. Jesus tells them, he tells them though, he has some good news for them. He says to the Jews, if you abide in my word, this is from John 8, starting with verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, that's... That's the first way that we're going to read this. Now I want to read it again with the subtext that Jesus intends to be heard in there as well. I want to say that the subtext explicitly. This is kind of how I was reading it as I was preparing for this sermon. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you haven't yet. You are truly my disciples. Still aren't though. And you will know the truth. Currently, you lack the truth. And the truth will set you free. You aren't free. But freedom is available. I think that's a more accurate reading of this conversation. The Jews respond, though, clearly showing that they do not understand what Jesus is trying to communicate. They say, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? They thought they really got Jesus with that one, I think. But they still don't understand. They don't know that they are in prison at this point. They feel secure, but for the wrong reasons. They're only fake free. 
Having your security taken away, though, that is a terrible feeling. If that's ever happened to you, when you've felt secure about something and it's been shattered, that is a terrible feeling. You wouldn't really wish it on anyone. The Jews felt secure because of their heritage, you know, their inclusion in the family of Abraham. They thought they were good, they were just fine, they were spiritual VIPs, maybe. They thought they were, they had they had it made. Jesus says that's not how it works, though. Now, you and I, we probably don't walk around feeling really secure in our ancestry. I don't know. It seems like the more I learn about my extended family, the worse I... No, I won't go into that, but... Uh, <laughs> But we, we probably don't, we're probably not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a ch child of Abraham, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, uh, so I guess, I guess the problem that the Jews had, that's not our problem. So, phew, we got nothing to worry about from this text today. We can skate on by. We're, we're, not, we're not doing the wrong thing here, right? Right? <laughs> nah, it turns out there's some things for us in this text, too. Do we ever find security in the wrong things? I don't want to speak for all of you, but I sure do sometimes. There's all kinds of things in this world, all kinds of things in this life that are lining up, trust in me, just embrace me and you'll feel more secure, all sorts of things. And, and it, becomes a, it becomes a first commandment issue. You, know, you shall have no other gods before me. We talk about, you know, you, you hear about idolatry and things in the Old Testament. You're like, well, I don't, I don't fashion something out of wood or stone and bow down to it, so I guess I'm not sinning against that. But, oh, don't we, don't we, though? Not literally things like that, but don't we bow down, <laughs> maybe not literally, but figuratively, to all sorts of things. And, and sometimes, you know, it might be that we... Just our whole reality is, is based in this. We feel secure because we've really gone off the wrong way. Sometimes we just, we veer off and we begin to take our eyes off of Jesus, off of what God has done for us, and we start to feel more secure in other things. You know, there's all sorts of good things God gives to us, but, but if, they, if they unseat God, if they become an idol for us, then now, now, we're, now we're in a dangerous situation. Now we're starting to build a prison for ourselves being secure in other things. So Luther was fond of talking about the first commandment. You know, a, another God, another idol is something that, that gives you the security or, or meaning in your life that God uh, supremely should have. And that's how we, we go wrong sometimes. It's all sorts of things that might make us feel secure. Could be, you know, there's, there's things that we really cling to. Sometimes they're, they're uh, for seasons of our life. Like perhaps it's, it's something, um, you know, physical. Uh, back in the day, I was such a good athlete, you know, and that was my, that was my identity, you know, and my, it, it, for, for me personally, like my, my tennis results rose and fell, my security rose and fell, and, and sometimes maybe that's for us for a while, it's something physical, something that we're gifted in, and then something changes, right? You get older, or you have an injury, and then, oh, you don't feel so secure in that area anymore. If that's what your life's built upon, it kind of comes crashing down. Though there's other things, too. It could, be, it could be a job or a career. That can make you feel real secure until you don't have it anymore, right? Whether you retire or whether you lose the job, oh, then you don't feel so secure anymore. It could be money. could be possessions until those things go away or until you see somebody else that has more than you. Oh, now I don't feel so secure anymore could be achievements, awards, promotions, accomplishments, you know, until that well runs dry or somebody else does something, you know, they're the latest and greatest. And now your, your identity, if it's shifting like this in the wind, you're not going to feel so secure after a while. You're going, oh, my sense of reality is turned upside down. You need something a little more foundational, a little more secure, right? That's got to come from outside of us, as we know. These things will fail you for one reason or another. And maybe at some point, you know, when they're going well, you think, oh, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm in the house, right? And then it comes crashing down, and you're like, ah, oh, just like Jesus said, I'm, I'm a slave to these things. I'm not secure. 
Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever, though. So Jesus further reveals how bad the situation is. It's, it's an either or with the highest stakes. Either you're slaves to sin or you are a son or a daughter and you're in, right? But he, Jesus goes uh, far, farther in chapter 8. We didn't, we, our gospel for Reformation doesn't go too far into John 8. But Jesus eventually says, you know, hey, your father isn't even Abraham. It's actually, you're, you're children of the devil, right? If, if you're slaves to sin, without the intervention, without the salvation from God, the devil is the father. Martin Luther experienced uh, a lot of insecurity. He experienced being in prison because he was trying to find security in things really other than Jesus, right? He was, well, Jesus does some things, but you know, you've got you've to work and you've got to do these lists of things and you've got to add something to feel secure. And he and many people like him never felt secure in those days, right? It was a constant, I wonder where I am on God's charts, right? Am I high today? Am I low today? I, you never quite felt secure. You never felt like you were a son or a daughter. You didn't know. But then he found that freedom in the son, the freedom that the son can give. Romans 3, our epistle lesson, this is one of the foundational verses for Luther and for the Reformation. It says, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus says this at the end of the gospel reading. He says, so if the son, that's how I read it. He says, you know, he talks about the son. Then he says, so if the son, that's him, right? If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. A slave falsely secure in their sin has no place in the house of God. Only a son or a daughter has a place. And so Jesus, as the son, he has the authority to say, you're in. You're going to be a co-heir with me in the household of God. Not fake free. That's not what Jesus gives. Not a fake kind of freedom. It is free. You are free indeed, as Jesus says. Jesus gave up his own freedom, right? He gave up his own place in the house of God to come down to this earth to make sure that you and I would have a place in the household of God so that we would be free indeed. So the Son came down from heaven to this earth. He spoke his word of truth. He invited all people to abide in it. And then he gave himself up. He gave up his own freedom as we remember the events of Holy Week. He gives up his own freedom. He allows people to take his body and so that he would be battered and bloodied and bruised and eventually nailed to a cross and he would die. And he would be locked into the prison of the tomb, dead. But only for three days, right? That tomb could not hold Jesus and so he was raised to life. And now, we remember those words that Jesus spoke to his disciples even before he died. You know, he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to be where I am. In the Father's house, the Son is preparing a place for you. He began that process on the cross, right? And even now, he is preparing a place because he has set you free and you are a son or a daughter of the Heavenly Father. The word of Jesus changes our reality. So we had the beginning part when I so rudely upset your whole wonderful, it was, it was a naive you know, prison, I guess, but Jesus does the opposite. He takes us out of our, the prison of our sin and he declares us to be free. We are thankful to Martin Luther and all those faithful people in his stead that have declared the fullness 
of the gospel so that we can hear it and we can abide in it and we can know the truth and, know, and be set free. Free indeed. The Son has declared you to be free indeed. You have a place in the Father's house by the grace of God. It is a most wonderful feeling to have our world turned upside down like this in a good way. To hear we have been set free from our sins. You are free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all of our human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Just one note about our prayers before we pray them. Um, what was neglected to be mentioned beforehand by myself was the consideration that our gifts would go to serve an LCMS world relief. So if you want to add more to your gifts, you, you may, knowing that what they're actually going for. So we're, we're going to pray that those funds be used to help people, of course, in the wake of Helene and, and of course, other disasters that have happened as of late. We're going to respond to our prayers with um, um, LSB 780, O Lord, hear my prayer. We'll sing that through first before we begin our prayers. <laughs> Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for all your goodness and tender care, especially on this Reformation Festival. Thank you for the gift of your Son and for the revelation of your will and grace. Implant your word in us and give us fertile hearts to keep it and bring forth its good fruit in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. God of grace, you keep us steadfast in your word and prevent the wayward hearts from following false gospels that lead us away from you. Provide your church with faithful pastors who preach in purity and joy that we are saved by your grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy. Mighty God, you gave you you have great power, and yet you act with mercy. Teach those who lead us to use power rightly for the preservation of order, the accomplishment of justice, the protection of life, and defense of the weak. Give us wise, godly, faithful leaders who will follow your commands and serve with integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, remember all who face adversity of any kind, including all those who are fighting illness in any of the congregations of those giving you praise here today. We also ask that you be with all who have faced any loss at the hands of traumatic events in connection with recent hurricanes and natural disasters. We ask that you comfort them by your Holy Spirit, that they would acknowledge their afflictions as the manifestation of your fatherly will. Lord, in your mercy.
preserve your church, O Lord, and each of us as members of Christ's body, that we may not surrender the true gospel for any reason, but be kept in this faith and fear throughout the days of our earthly pilgrimage until the day when we and all your people shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the reward you have prepared for us and all who have loved his appearing. To the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.